Thanks for, uh, thanks for having us here. We're going to uh, kind of get into this fairly quickly. And um, I want to start by introducing myself, Rich Galen. I write a column on the internet called Mullings, M-U-L-L-I-N-G-S dot com. Uh, it's currently three days a week. It's mostly politics, some, some current events, some, some just stuff that pops into my head. <clears throat> it's free, so you can just go to mullings.com and get it. Or if I can guilt you into paying me $30, it's like NPR. You can still listen, but you just got to pay me $30 to do it. Um, and it's been pretty successful. I've been doing it for about 15 years. And, um, and it, it's, it's, it's got a pretty broad, broad, pretty broad readership. Uh, let's go down the line and let uh, each of our panelists introduce themselves. Uh, why don't we start on the far end? Uh, I'm John Brabender. I'm a uh, Republican media consultant. Uh, my job is to tell stories on behalf of Republican candidates and been doing it for uh, more than half my life and uh, happy to be here. Uh, Christopher Cox, uh, first let me thank the conference attendees and the Michigan Republican Party um, for the invitation. Uh, I have a little bit of a different background than some of the panelists. Um, I come from uh, the world uh, of uh, uh, brand marketing, consumer segmentation, and uh, political micro-targeting. And uh, you know, I'm uh, director of client strategy at Resonate, and Resonate is, um, in essence, a, a, a digital marketing company that helps um, understand and target uh, the why, why voters make decisions to support a candidate, to support an issue, to support a specific political party. Um, we're all about trying to understand how to change the conversation, interject um, big data, and ultimately lead to you know, highly targeted, highly efficient campaigns for uh, our clients. I'm Peter Koenig. You're on. I'm on. Um, and I'm with FLS Connect. We're out of Minnesota. I lead the data science team there. Our core products are uh, grassroots uh, voter contact and fundraising. Data is critical to what we do. Um, over the past two years, we spent a lot of time and effort in learning about big data. And uh, over the past year, we've started to implement big data platforms. So we're very excited to um, discuss that with you today. And thank you for having us. Uh, I'm Brent Seaborn. I'm partner at Target Point Consulting, which has some uh, deep Michigan roots. Um, one of my partners, Alex Gage, who many of you may know, Michael Myers, another partner of mine from Michigan. We started a, uh, an analytics company, a, a big data company, before big data was a thing, I guess. Um, in, in 2002, we started playing with it in anticipation of being able to uh, really expand the use of data in the 2004 presidential race. We used it in a couple of gubernatorial races in 2002, and then um, we're, we're ready to go in 2004. Since then, we've evolved that process of, of what we call micro-targeting uh, to do a lot more things, to be much smarter, uh, to be a little bit more dynamic. Uh, also, over the course of those years, I've, I've worked a little bit at the RNC in the, in the data and strategy shop there. So I have a little bit of, of experience um, working on, on, the, on the party side of things and knowing what it's like not being an analyst, but actually having to push data out to support all the activities the party does. Uh, and just recently, we're starting or launching a new company called Deep Root Analytics, which is going to apply a lot of the same things to television uh, and make our media buy a little bit more data-driven and try to find some efficiencies where we can be more effective and, and maybe start to spend uh, our money differently on television. Why don't we start with a definition so we're all kind of thinking about the same thing. But Peter, why don't you start this part of the discussion? In, in your world, how do you define big data? Well, I mean, big data has been a buzzword within media for uh, uh, at least the past two years. A lot, of people, a lot of articles have been written about it. And the real principle behind this and uh, the real genesis of, of the big data uh, space was the result of the internet search giants. They were generating unbelievable amounts of data in a, in, in a, in a format that just didn't work in your traditional relationship-style uh, database. And Generally, within the community, uh, there's uh, three key tenets. Some people add a, a, a fourth or a fifth, but uh, it's, it's basically about the size, um, the speed that you can work with that size, and then, it, then the variety or the type of data that you, work, you can work with. And the real challenge that a lot of enterprises have had over the, um, o over the past number of years has been as the digital space has grown and as a lot more sensors are sending data back and mobile devices are becoming more plentiful, that uh, 
that, that data was coming in a format that was non-structured or not in a table form is what we're all used to working in. And so bringing that into that type of environment was very difficult. And so these new platforms have been developed that basically natively allow you to take, uh, take that data that comes from a mobile type device and blend it with your traditional table, um, uh, uh, table type data. And the advantages you get from that are, are, are many. Uh, the blending is the key of that. There's a lot of challenges as a result of that, but um, uh, the application of, of, of uh, big data principles have really allowed a lot of companies to get a much better, uh, op, uh, really focus more on customer care, and in our business it's going to be more about voter care. And um, so the, the three tenants generally are all around the size, the speed, and, and the variety. And Chris, what about from your vantage point? So I'll speak on behalf of, of Resonates. Um, perspective, we do roughly 150,000 consumer surveys a year. Uh, that's about 94 million unique questions. And we use that information so that we can hyper-target our advertising or you know, marketing um, solutions to people using um, the values, the motivators, the issues that really matter to them. Um, what that leads to is, is efficiency. The problem with an asking 94 million questions is you have to be able to do something with that information. And you have to be able to do something with the information before the information becomes worthless, before a campaign is over, before um, you know, people ch you know, change their minds, or current events um, ultimately cause changes in public perception. So we've had to build a platform that allows us to make those marketing decisions and allow our, our consumers to use that information in near real time. Um, that involves you know, processing literally thousands of terabytes of data um, on, a, on a regular basis. It's a massive amount of, of data ingesting. Um, we, we look at it um, as really four stages. There's the ingestion, the absorption, assimilation, and then the ultimate um, actionability of the data. And each one of those four tenets are really important, and they, they require massive amounts of investment, but at the same time, they can yield pretty amazing results and, and really change um, the business ecosystem um, and give you an advantage over you know, the way it was done uh, in the last decade. As a media guy, how do you... Yeah, I'm going to... You're gonna, the user of this. Yeah, I am the user of it, and I'm going to think like a media guy and probably make this a little bit more visual, which is how I do everything. Again, as the media guy, I really want big data for two things. One is to make sure I'm reaching the most persuadable voters, and I'm not wasting money on people I can't persuade with an ad or anything else. And number two is I want to personalize the message as much as possible. Now, we've always had data, but the comparison that I think of when I think of visually big data, if you picture sort of a scene of a crime. In the 80s, 90s, and early 2000s, the type of data we have we could get a picture of that scene of the crime by saying to somebody, draw a freehand with a Crayola crayon what's going on here, and that would give us a picture. Then micro-targeting came along, and it improved it tremendously, and it would be like saying, hey, now we have a professional sketch artist here who's going to do a composite sketch based upon a large number of people telling him what happened at that scene of the crime. What big data does is there's so much information and it can be processed so quickly and efficiently in and, and ways that it couldn't before. It's like having 10 high-def cameras at the scene of the crime and making a composite little video for you of what's really going on. That's the comparison of how much more information we have and how much more useful and what a visualized picture we have compared to what we really used to have. Brent? Uh, when we talk about big data and what it means, I think we've had a pretty good definition of, what it, of, of how it works. I think the one thing that, on a very simple, uh, rather than abstract kind of concept, that we need to realize is the willingness and ability to integrate data. And that is, having worked in this data for a while, the one place that I think we can focus on the most as party, and, and any volunteer or anybody running an organization can focus on, is just data integration. Um, it used to be that we, we weren't unable, technically, to integrate much of this data. There's no reason that we can't integrate data anymore, either on an individual basis, or on a lookalike basis, or even on a modeled basis. Um, so what we're learning is that all of this data can be put together if we want it to be. The bigger challenge we have now is the institutional willingness and force to do this. And you still have lots of organizations 
who say they want to do big data and they want to do these solutions, but they still segregate data into silos. And it's, it's pushing these silos down and forcing data sharing amongst organizations in a state or departments in a campaign or between even organizations operating um, in, in similar spaces. We don't always want to share data. We don't always want to integrate data. And there's times that we want data to be, to be proprietary. But usually, when we silo off data and we make it proprietary, we're doing the opposite of a big data solution. We've talked, it, it, almost all of you, some mentioned micro-targeting in the context of big data. Somebody help us understand, A, what the relationship is, and B, what the definition of micro-targeting is as well. I, I guess you could probably get five or six different definitions of, of what micro-targeting is. Uh, when we started working with a concept we called micro-targeting back in 2002 and 2004, what we're really talking about is, is combining voter file data, commercial data, and large sample surveys, and then uh, building statistical models, probability models off of that. Um, a lot of people will call micro-targeting when they buy a list uh, of hunters from the Secretary of State. Certainly that is a way of micro-targeting. You're targeting a very small group of people with a specific message of known interest. Um, typically when, when we're talking about it, uh, or at least when I'm talking about it, I'm talking about model data, project, projected data. We always know that individually identifiable data, hard data, whether it's through lists or identification, is, is a very good tool and one that we need to have uh, more of and collect more of. But to fill in those gaps and be able to write models and algorithms to predict behavior is, is a, a very strong supplement to that. So I would say when we're talking micro-targeting, I would say usually it, it's predicted modeled behavior. Um, it's usually, in our case, usually done off of a voter file, merging opinion data and um, commercially available databases. John? Well, I was going to say, but the thing I think is important is that micro-targeting in retrospect is pretty crude compared to big data in the sense that everything is about making a projection or a prediction to some degree, and what you're doing is extrapolating something from a decent size of samples. But what big data says is we're throwing everything in there. We're throwing incredible amounts of data in real time coming from sources that never existed, and what they're finding is you're finding all these correlations that you never would have found before until you threw all the data in there. And you know, you're seeing it in politics now where one of the data, and I know Brent works on this, is, is uh, all the cable systems have all the, 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 the information on the boxes of what people are watching. Well, you can combine all that data with other social networking data and all sorts of other things to really predict who's going to show up and vote, what is, issues are they interested in, and then in those, some of those cases, advertise to them directly on the household level in certain cable systems. Uh, you couldn't do that before. Chris, does it work? Yeah, I was going to say, I, I think it's, it's important not to miss the application of big data, which is what I think the majority of people care about, which is the right message to the right person in the right place at the right time. Without the right application of big data, you can crunch all the numbers you, know, you want all day long, um, but it's not really doing any good. I think that the, the political industry has embraced it. Um, certainly, you know, the brand marketers have used it for a long time, but it, it doesn't, it can't take the place of a good candidate or a bad economy in terms of determining an election. So it's, it's really important to think about that. Um, the way, one of the things and the challenges that I've seen um, at Resonate is that the speed of creative production needs to keep pace with the understanding and the, the tactical marketing that big data can allow. And so that's gonna be a challenge. Um, if you don't have the right message, you may know the right person, you may know where to target them, you may know when to hit them with that message, but you still have to understand what's gonna be relevant and what's going to um, really persuade someone to take a specific action. Peter, is, where, what are some of the obstacles that people kind of run into when they're trying to either gather this data or use it? Or well, the, it? Uh, just from a, from a pure technical standpoint, it's a, it's, it's a pretty big haul still at this point to build a big data system. Um, it's uh, the, the technical uh, personnel you need for it are fairly, uh, fairly high level, and they tend to be, it tends to be very competitive to get those type of folks. Um, that's, that's one of the key obstacles if you're trying to build it at a, a local level or at a state level, for a, especially for a, a, a campaign that's only gonna be around for a couple months. Um, those, are, those are real challenges that uh, 
um, you'd see, and that's um, and that's one of the, the things that we've seen as we've been we've been uh, uh, building out our da big data architecture is that the investments that are necessary now you're, we're really looking for how they'll impact 2014, and then what we learn from that can help in 2016. And so, the um, I, I think as a party we need to look and say, what what um, technical assets can we invest in that we can that we can count on. Uh, to help us in, in, in upcoming elections, because without those technical key, uh, pieces, in, in addition to the uh, the analytics side, but just the pure technical side, it's going to be a real challenge. Because it's not like just spinning up access or something like that. It's it's a it's a significant um, significant uh, resources are needed at this point. Um, beyond that, the opportunity though is just uh, once you have the, once you have the system up. I mean, data becomes data. You don't have to worry about if it's you know unstructured or structured. It's just data, and then you can work on figuring out how you can uh, be really creative and identify ways to use it to your advantage and really uh, talk to the voter in the, right, in the right manner, make sure you're spending your time in the right place, make the right decisions based on evidence. Um, but the challenges are, are, are significant, and so we as a party make sure, have to make sure that we are dedicating the resources to build the infrastructure to, handle, uh, to have this ability for us going forward. Otherwise, we're going to be at a significant disadvantage. Right, without giving away any company secrets, is there is there a mechanism whereby you folks can test the test the theories that are coming out of this data before you actually commit to to ads or to mail or to advertising? Uh, of course, I mean that's uh, there's always ways to test things. It's a matter of, of having the time and, and the interest and budget doing it. We can test things almost forever. There's always what works well in the lab doesn't always work well in the field. So you, you still need to have, uh, I think, particularly in politics, it's really important to have some people that you trust who have some experience to be able to say, we've looked at this before, and that just isn't the way it works in politics. But I think what we have to do is, is test these assumptions. Um, we work off of a lot of kind of old saws that you need to win this part of the state by this many points, or this is the target group. And, and it's not that any of those things are untrue, but sometimes we, we live and die like it, it's some sort of uh, political Bible we have with these old saws that, that remain largely untested. And I think what we can do now is we can start to run scenarios and test all of those things ahead of time. So we can say that is true. We do need to win X county or X demographic by this many points, so this is our, our key focus. But the, being able to test all of this and, and be able to test all of these sort of old campaign techniques and, and this old wisdom, I think, is really important. I, for a long time, people have compared big data to Moneyball, and that's a really interesting kind of application. And Moneyball, uh, you said that what we did with microtargeting looks really old now. When you read the book Moneyball, it looks really silly now because everybody just does that stuff automatically. And, and you still have ball clubs like Oakland who's, who continue to innovate and, and continue to apply these principles, even though what was very successful for them 10 years ago looks silly now. We're in a lot the same place that what we need to do is is From that book a lot of people believe that we can run entire baseball clubs just based on algorithms That was never really the case the point was you could give data and algorithms and predictive models To decision makers and you could allow them to make data driven decisions They can choose to do what the data says not to do But it's a choice that they've made to not do what the data says and that's sometimes a very valid choice Sometimes you can test hypotheses that that you believe to be true and you may prove not to be true. But the idea that um, we could just run things on computers and simulations, I think is a little bit wrong. We, we need to be able to test and, and make decisions based on the data. And I think we need to integrate this data and we need to have greater acceptance of data um, in all of the things that we're doing in a, in a party right now or as conservatives right now. Chris, what, what do you, when, when you guys are putting together a, a potential advertising program for a client, do, and, and the client says, how do I know this is going to work? What do you say? Uh, measurement, the good thing about digital advertising is that it's inherently it's inherently measurable medium. Um, unlike, the, unlike TV and some of the older marketing channels, you, you have the precision of being able to measure every single interaction. Every time someone clicks on a display ad, every time someone visits a candidate's fan page, every time someone views a video, every time someone visits a website, you can track that back to the individual user. And when you have the ability to use big data to, to, to sync these different data sets so that there is interoperability between the two and you can understand the, um, the key pieces of information about that individual, you know who you're reaching, you know who you're targeting, you know who's responding. 
um, we use a tool called advertising effectiveness, which is actually a quantitative, it's a survey-based tool um, that understands shifts in, in candidate favorability or understands shifts in uh, perception around um, issue positions or understands um, what messages are most effective in getting someone to turn out to the polls. And so when we're running campaigns for um, our you know, political professionals or, or issue advocacy professionals, we understand, we use those as inputs um, to define success. It's not just about getting clicks anymore. It's not just about getting views. It's about truly shifting perception, taking people who are persuadable and making them supporters, um, taking people who are opposed to your candidate and making them um, you know, in favor of your candidate. And, and those are all things that we can now track and those are some of the things that we do at Resonate. Yet, John, through it all, TV advertising is still the he bull. It, it is, but it's all changing. I mean, first of all, probably the budgets I spend for my clients about 25% is now in the digital world versus the broadcast world. And, and, but what's happening is we're going to a multi-platform world. I never look just at TV, mail, digital anymore. I'm looking across it for this reason. For the first time this year, over 50% of the people, or more people spend time on digital, more time on digital than they do on broadcast TV, first time ever. How we watch TV has changed. When we're watching TV, 63% are actually doing some other thing, usually something digital. So invented what we now call social television. The other thing too is where digital had a big advantage, as you were saying, we could monitor everything. We had all this great analytics and so forth. Cable's now getting there. Uh, Netflix is now a broadcaster, they're there, and pretty soon you're gonna find all the major broadcasters are gonna have all this analytics in that sphere as well, and then that's gonna change every ball game there is. So anybody have any worries about collecting all this information, all these data points on people? I mean, given what's been going on with the NSA and everything, has there come a point where, some, where there'll be a pushback from the public saying, look, I understand that there's the internet of things, and my cell phone talks to who knows how many computers just while it's in my pocket. Is that, is that becoming an issue, or you think it will become an issue? I believe that uh, you know, any, any purveyor of data has to have a serious uh, data governance policy within, within their organization to ensure that the use of data is clearly understood. I mean, with us in, our, in working in the political space, uh, the data we, we work with is largely politically available. So uh, the information that we gather, people have made a choice to, to follow us or to be friends with us. And so the information that we're gathering is, is largely you know, open and available. Uh, it's, there is a, I, I do believe we have to be uh, constantly vigilant in terms of how we handle, handle that responsibility. And um, it, you know, if the public decides that they don't want data to, uh, um, uh, to be used in certain ways, we'll obviously honor that. But, it, uh, but I, I don't have a significant concern just because with big data, the, just native within it, uh, the, the big part of it is that when you're talking about a person, it, it, you know, it, the value is that obviously we're going to talk to you hopefully at a, you know, in a manner that you'd wish to be sp spoken to at a time you wish to be spoken to, but we're not going to specifically know that it's you. And I, I know that sounds, that sounds like, uh, sounds bad, but I mean, in the sense, I mean, that it, most of the state is anonymized. And so you, you, we're not dealing with, you know, uh, uh, Rich Galen. We're dealing with uh, a, a group of Rich Galens or, you know, Obviously, very intelligent people. A, a so bunch of short, yeah. fat, bald, 66-year-old <laughs> yes, exactly. Jewish exactly. guys. <laughs> Got it. <laughs> you, John, or Chris, you were, you were nodding your head. Well, here's where I think we haven't reached the danger point yet, and the reason is these guys have done a great job creating the data. We're now moving in the stage of personalization, utilizing that data. And first of all, we already know in surveys out there, something like 86% of the people do not want personalized advertising because they feel it's a privacy issue. As soon as you go on Facebook and they pick up a pattern that you do your grocery shopping every Monday, and so there's a Facebook ad Monday morning that says today when you go shopping, don't forget to buy milk, people are gonna start getting the joke that there is a lot of data out there. So I think the real concern's gonna come in when it's put in a more applicable way of personalizing specific messages on a household by household basis. I had a uh, client that, that was having an issue with a a nutraceutical company, a supplement company. And when I was doing some of the writing for it, I, I had to look at the company's website and, and look at their product line. And instantaneously, uh, every web page I went to that had nothing to do with that started serving up 
supplement ads because somewhere in the great data collection they they knew that I, they thought that I was interested in that, but it was it was pretty interesting. So can for for folks out here and for for people running state and state parties and what have you, how would how would they use this kind of data? I mean, there's, a, there's data information and knowledge, and then I guess wisdom if you go far enough. But how do you take this data and turn it into the knowledge to build, let's say, coalitions? Chris, want to take a whack at that? Sure. I, I think that, you know, first you have to understand how you're going to collect information. And if you're not going to collect it yourself, what is important to, to, to target when you're, when you're looking at a big data provider or you're, you're trying to... Um, uh, work with you know consultants or or you know the national party or the statewide party. Um, what is what is of importance? What can you add to the equation? Um, you know, there's a saying in big data that that nothing is unimportant. You want to collect everything, um, and you want to assimilate all that and try and tie it all together. I, I think you know as far as um, I, I get that question a lot. You know, I, I'm a, a, a small con even a congressional district, or I'm a, a you know running for a, a, the state senate. How can I? I don't have the budget. I don't have hundreds of thousands of dollars to invest in these systems. What can I do? And th there's a wealth of um, certainly online. There's a wealth of publicly available, generally free tools that allow you to not only collect information but understand more about your audience. Um, that un you know allow you to tie things together to 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 paint a picture around. Um, what you should understand and what's going to, you know, motivate someone to take a specific action. So, um, working with, you know, some of the free analytics tools that are out there, whether it's, you know, social media monitoring, whether it's a tool like Google Analytics, um, whether it's a, um, you know, some of the free um, uh, uh, li linguistic um, natural language processing software. I think, you know, using those things first, and then also looking at. Um, you know the organizations that offer these tools as part of a you know a marketing service or as part of um, another part of you know campaign um, management that ultimately embody this technology and this functionality. Fred, you guys are doing some unique things with with language. Why don't you talk about that a little bit? I, I think that I mean trying to figure out sentiment analysis right now. I think is is kind of the tip of the spear in terms of of how this fits in. I, I, there's I think a lot that can be done there. I think we're learning the technology. I think we're learning how it fits in. Uh, it is really amazing when you look at natural language processors, how they can go through and they will, they will literally read everything and code it and tell you whether it was good or bad. And they can look for keywords. And, and, and finding how that folds into a system uh, of, of other analytics. You have so many analytical tools. What you need to do now is you need to find a way that, that you that they all integrate as well. That uh, it, it goes back to integration and, and, and more and more integration. And, and having a great tool on its own that doesn't integrate with the rest of your campaign, the rest of your data, the rest of your analytics, um, makes it not as valuable. So right now we're trying to find a way that we can integrate sentiment analysis, social media sentiment analysis, even, even paid media and, and um, earned media analysis into the overall spectrum of campaign activities, which I think when you look at something like the communications department of a campaign, and you look at how big that is and how much work they do, and generally you quantify it at the end of the day by saying, hey, we had a good day or bad day, based on how many calls you had from reporters or where the story was placed in a newspaper. But it really is not a, a data-driven department of a, of a campaign or an organization. I think using sentiment analysis provides a great tool to bring that online with the rest of the analytics that, that a campaign and organization does and using it to quantify the, the value and the reach of what a communications part department does in a state party or a campaign or, or, or any organization that's working in the, in the earned media space. John was talking a little bit earlier about the, um, uh, about the fact that 60-something that percent of people do something else while they're watching TV. Um, at what point at what point does, does television as we've known it, I've known it you know, since the 1950s, uh, at what point does was the, what we define as tele television and radio for that matter go away and it all becomes one big compilation? Well, let's start with this fact that people under 30 years of age, <clears throat> one third of them don't have a TV because they're now watching on some other device. Uh, you know, 
appointment TV doesn't exist anymore, where you say, I'm going to watch on Tuesday nights at 8 o'clock this. Everything's time shifted now. So you might have a viewer for that show, but it doesn't mean it's the same viewing audience for uh, the advertising, uh, which is a big difference. TV does not exist today like it, 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 it did just five years ago, and it's going to be a bigger blend. What's happening very quickly is mobile is becoming the source for short-term video, and tablets are actually becoming the source for longer-term videos. And so all this is going to go together. But I want to go to something Brent said earlier that I do think is important. Big data is a tool. It's not a crutch. And the, the part that makes me nervous is because you can get all this information on a nightly basis, the, the Obama people swear they did 60,000 60, simulations a night, that candidates can become very, very codependent upon this type of data for making decisions. And if that happens, campaigns are going to have a real problem. I'm always cautious to predict the death of any medium. I think that we saw that happen a lot with newspaper. Uh, you know. Uh, about five to seven years ago, and newspaper, the business of newspaper advertising has shifted to be you know, online. And so when we're talking about TV or whether the synergies or lack of synergies between the different mediums, I think it's important to, to understand what's the appropriate distribution within those different mediums. Um, we used to just talk about digital, and digital generally meant display advertising. Um, and now digital is mobile versus tablet. It's, it's um, long form versus short form video. It's display advertising. It's native advertising. It's social media. So understanding the different facets of all the different channels um, how, and how they work together. Cross media measurement is going to be increasingly important for marketers because you need to know how your TV complements your, your rich media display, which you know also has the same message that you ran last week in the Sunday edition. Um, and, and syncs nicely back to your radio spot. All of those channels and tactics serve different purposes, and it's understanding what's the appropriate expenditure in each of those tactics that's really going to lead to truly effectively use, utilizing each one of them. Peter, do you guys close, do you guys close the loop? Do you use telephone and all the other ways of collecting data? Uh, to, we understand that you do that to, to get the data sets organized. But does that fold back again into phone calls you make and, and decisions, yes. advertising decisions? Absolutely. I mean, the, the information that's uh, generated from, uh, from an interaction with a voter is, uh, is used to inform future interactions. So, uh, you know, the beauty of this, uh, of the move towards, you know, this big data environment is it allows us to have a greater understanding of what that interaction actually contained as opposed to just uh, you know, a, a, transactional, um, a transactional record. So the ability to understand if uh, you know, six months ago what somebody believed was significant, how that, if, if that's something that's still significant with them today, that ability to track that together and not just to do it on one person, but be able to you know, look at that in an overall um, uh, trend analysis. And it can give you some real value in terms of where uh, it's a good leading indicator on, on where, where we stand in a lot of, uh, a lot of races. And, and, um, and it's, a, uh, it, it, it's really valuable in terms of uh, helping us have, a, a, you know, um, producing the, um, the best outcome for, uh, for each call, because each call is something that really is, uh, um, you know, it, it's, a, it's the one personal interaction that many people have with, with political entities. And so making that experience as positive as possible is, is key to them. John, keeping on the end of the closed loop kind of thing, tell us about how or if when you, when you produce an ad and you put it up in whatever, on whatever medium uh, you, you put it up on, how do, what, what kind of information does that feed back to you? Well, well, first of all, that whole process has changed dramatically. It used to be that if you did an ad and nobody particularly liked it, you'd say, let's put it on YouTube. And you know, more than often than not, they look like some type of hostage video or something. <laughs> you know, now, when we produce something, we're, we're looking for two things. One is, um, certainly, we don't care if it's on TV or digital or wherever. We want the right viewers. And number two, though, digital oftentimes and some of these other platforms give us creative opportunities that didn't exist before. We're not restricted to 30 seconds, for example, to pay for something. But the bottom line is, where big data helps us in this case, is we no longer care about eyeballs. We now care more about engagement. And what it's able to do is give us the right people who actually are going to respond to something and watch it for the right reason is engaged to it, 
versus that we just happen to be an uninvited guest in their home. How do you know that that's happened? We can measure it particularly with a lot of these mediums. One of the things that the Obama people did very well is they would test all sorts of videos to smaller audiences, get the response rates, and then they would roll that out to much bigger audiences. They did the same thing with all their email fundraising tests and so forth. We're all political hacks uh, to some degree or another. So how f are we behind, are Republicans still behind, in, or were we ever? And if we are behind, how long will it take to catch up with the Democrats and all this? Can I take that one? Yeah, sure. I think we got beaten uh, in a big media uh, data kind of perspective last cycle, and it was almost inevitable. Uh, I think we had the same data available to us. I think we did a lot of smart things or had access to a lot of smart things. What we lacked uh, was the time and the force of will to integrate all of this data and build the systems necessary to do it. And it would have been almost impossible to do. I think we fall into a real trap if we say, I'm gonna do what Obama did. I think we should use it as a guide. I think that what they did right is, is make data-driven decisions and data integration throughout their campaign. I think we're gonna fall into a real trap if we think we can run that every time. We can't. There's no, there's no organization here that is going to have the time, the budget, or the atmosphere, a national campaign where things are, are actually, things scale nationally in big data much better than they do locally. Um, so that environment was unique to them. They had four years to plan, they had four years to prepare, they had built the infrastructure, not just the campaign infrastructure that required data sharing between departments, but the technical infrastructure. Mm -hmm. I, I don't think there's any way we could have fully competed um, with that. We could have been better, we could have done more. I, the other thing I think we're gonna fall into a trap is if people who are running organizations look back at what they did and say, I'm going to do technically what they did because things have already evolved so far beyond that that if we get in a trap of doing what President Obama's campaign did in 2011 and 2012, we're gonna be two or three years behind where we need to be. I think we could be forward looking. I, I think we need to make sure we don't get spun up uh, becoming too technical or making the perfect enemy of the good. We need to make incremental improvements. Uh, we do need to build these systems that allow us the, the technical structure to do this, but we really, as a party, need to work to change the, our, our attitude toward data. We need to become more data literate. I think we all need to understand this a little bit more and be willing to use it and find the right applications and balance for data. I don't know if you want to talk any more about the data infrastructure that what could or couldn't have even been possibly been built I, on the short time that no, I agree with Romney you. had. Yeah, I agree with you in, in that sense. I mean, the, uh, to their credit, the, uh, the Obama organization did a wonderful job of taking advantage of the, their incumbent status, and, uh, and, and they used that time well. They knew they were going to be, they were, they were gonna be the nominee, and they used that well, and they did something that uh, we, we didn't have the opportunity to do, which was uh, we had a long period of time, to have that long period of time to build systems that were enduring, and, and then really, uh, to their credit, like you say, they, they, they really forced their uh, decisions to be data-driven throughout their organization. That's the key thing I think we should learn from, from them, is that we need to, we need to have that uh, evidence-based decision-making and action in, in all, our, all our campaign entities going forward. And there's no, reason we, we, there's no reason we shouldn't be able to do that. You don't need big data to do that. Um, big data helps you um, make those decisions better. Um, but you don't need big data to do that. So if we aren't doing that right now in our, in our campaign organizations, in our, in our, in our parties, uh, that's our fault. Those are things that we can do without big data. But with big data, we could even do it uh, better and faster. And so I don't believe we're, uh, I, there's, there's, there's no real horse race right now in, in terms of what I see um, between us and the Democrats uh, on uh, using this technology because the technology is evolving. What will be used in, in 2015, the only thing we can say is that you need to have systems that, that can handle all data. Um, you know, th there's so many exciting things that are happening in that technical space right now that we will put to use in 2016 if we're smart. That will, that will allow us to be very competitive in close elections. But the key thing is that data helps us in close elections. If, we're, if, it's, if, it's, a, if it's a blowout, it's not, gonna, it's not gonna make the difference. We still need good candidates. We need to make the right decisions as a party um, to win elections. But this will help us in those close elections. Chris, do you think we're behind? If so, are we catching up or are we there? I, I, don't, I don't like to look at it in terms of being behind. Um, there's no doubt that the Obama campaign had the continuity um, from 08, which helped tremendously. Um, being able to, 
we all recognize the talent he had on his team in 08, and being able to keep them engaged was, I think, a remarkable feat. We're, we're talking about people that, you know, in the private sector would be, you know, pulling in incredibly lucrative salaries, working in, you know, doing some very innovative things, but they chose to stick with the candidate, and we need to, to be better about that. I, you know, I, I really was um, pleased by some of the things the chairman said at dinner last night, which is that we need to spend money earlier on in the cycle and invest in brand identity, invest in the, the, the Republican brand and reinvigorate what it means to be a Republican so that you know, we don't have to worry about the candidate coming on board and building his entire infrastructure from scratch every time. You know, we have a solid base and we've been talking to the base about what it means to be a Republican and why they should vote Republican regardless of who's you know, on the ticket. And I think that um, you know, and that's, that's, that's not a big data problem, but big data can, can help with that by understanding and segmenting these different people and understanding the motivators and the values and the belief systems and being able to effectively met, um, you know, advertise and effectively reach out and speak to the party rather than you know, a one-size-fits-all approach, rather than just you know, blanket messaging around specific issues. So um, I, I do think that you know, we have some catching up to do, but I don't think we're that far behind techno technologically. Well, you know, it's interesting. What, what happens that after every election is people want to say, here's why somebody won. Mm -hmm. And they clearly want to say, oh, it was this big dad operation. Everything these guys said is 100% right. It's the reason 95% of incumbents win, is that they had an operation that they could invest very early on that was expensive, time consuming, and build the foundation. On our side, we had a very competitive primary, and Mitt Romney had to win the primary and concentrate on that. You know, I still hear people say, well, I don't understand. Why didn't he go on the air earlier? He didn't have money. You know, when they were out defining him, he didn't have the money to respond. Those are the, the disadvantages of being an, uh, a challenger, quite frankly. But the key here is for us not to look at Obama and say, what did they do? Now we have to go do that. We literally have to say, what's going to be possible three years down the road? And how are we going to start the infrastructure now to get us there? Let's do a little philosophy. Back in the 80s, uh, this is well before Republicans even had a prayer of taking control of the House of Representatives. I was at the NRCC, and, and we got really, really good at putting campaigns together. We could put a campaign together almost anywhere in the country. Um, we could hire the management. We could hire the press people. We could hire the media guys. We could hire the fundraisers. We knew where to find everybody. We could put them into any campaign and make it work, and the campaign would function very well. What we've discovered, though, was that we had, we had developed these, because we're so smart in Washington, we had developed kind of an alu aluminum campaigns, uh, stainless steel campaigns. They, they were all sharp edge, edges and, and shiny. And what, we've, what we realized that we were losing, almost, not in the incumbents, but amongst the, the challenger and open, open seats, we were losing the close elections, and Joe Gaylord finally came up with the idea that maybe what's missing is we, we've successfully engineered the passion out of these campaigns. Is there a danger of all this technology, all this kind of all, new data, all these things that we're collecting, are we re-engineering the passion out of these campaigns? Brent, why don't you start? We'll go down the line. Uh, yeah, I think, we, I think we did that a while ago, and I think we're, we're, we're moving back the other way already. I, I think that for a long time, I, I've, I've worked at, at different levels of politics through the year, years and, and got to see different things. Um, I, can, I can still remember going into campaign headquarters and seeing you know, boxes of, of paper that were the IDs they made from last cycle that had never been entered in. Big data solution for that is, is entering it immediately electronically. But what we did when we started to do that and be able to enter data in immediately is we started to standardize all of the scripts that if you were calling someone to get out the vote or you were calling to identify someone you had a, a routinized script that you had to fill out. Uh, and, and that's okay, but it, we didn't allow or didn't have a line in there for like personal engagement. We didn't ask you to talk to these people. And there's certainly no way of putting that data into a database. If, even if you went off script and had a very good conversation with someone and really learned something important, we had no mechanism for loading that data back in. We actually now have mechanisms that we can load that kind of data back in and we can put in some open-ended responses. Uh, we can or should rely on, on people in the field to put more information in about their contact they have with voters. So I think, strangely, I think that the first bit of technology we used to do this limited the amount of passion we, or, or the amount of independence volunteers could have. 
looking back at, at, at what the Obama campaign did, they were fairly freeform. They did allow volunteers to go in and have an engagement with voters if they chose to. Um, certainly not everybody in the party wants to do that or is able to do that. Some people prefer to have the crutch of a script to read off of, and we can certainly support that. But we should be able to support more freeform interaction with data. And we now, because we're working with more unstructured data, should be able to load that kind of data back into a system where we can, we can track it. And, and when we start to develop better CRM systems, customer relationship management systems, um, we can put these notes in there. And we go back and we recontact this person. We can know what we've learned about them in the past. So I think we are at the tipping point where the technology is going to facilitate greater freedom for volunteers and activists to be able to go out and have a more real engagement and be able to let their own passion show through and then also be able to match people based on their passions. If, you, if you're interested in, in homeschooling or education reform, we should allow you to talk to people who are of similar interests rather than having you talk to people who are interested in guns. Um, they may have no interest in gun, in gun issues, may want to just talk about education. I think we can facilitate that with technology now and that is looking forward um, Instead of looking back, I think one of the things that we, we can support and, and should make an effort to really push. Peter. I agree. I mean, that's, uh, I, I think that the, uh, this, used correctly, this is going to uh, really, uh, if, if there's a lack of passion, really reward uh, interactions. Because the, the things that everybody, I would imagine, gets energized about is, is having success or having a positive interaction. This, the, this environment should allow that uh, the opportunity for success to be much greater. And the only, the only concern there would be is what John mentioned earlier, which is that if, if, uh, if a candidate or an organization are making decisions solely based on the data points they're seeing, that's where you remove the passion. But I, I look at this and saying the candidate should be able to, you know, the candidate or the organization should stick true to their mission and they'll just have a better I idea how to interact with their, uh, with, with their voting base. And, and so I, I think that um, every time that uh, every time we have success in the field, um, you know, it removes that barrier from, uh, you know, that, that I just spent time on interacting with somebody, and if I put time into that, uh, trying to relay that back to the campaign, is that the information ever going to be used? This is, this, these type of systems allow that, uh, allow that to happen. And the, the beauty of this is that these systems are built for the unknowable, so that while that information that was collected um, might not have an immediate application six weeks from now, that might be the piece that actually gives you the, the key to, to figure out this is how I can convince this person that they should really vote for our candidate. So I think, there's, I think the passion is in success that will come as a result of using these systems successfully. Yeah, th there's no replacing the passion, charisma, energy of uh, a campaign, campaign volunteers and campaign staff. I mean, you have to have people that believe in the cause and the candidate because that's gonna manifest itself in, in all of the campaign activities. Um, you know, no matter how sophisticated marketing gets, there is no marketing tactic more effective than word of mouth um, from friends and family. So it's, you know, some of the, the analytical tools that are being developed, the technology that, that's being implemented allows the collection and the analysis to be done faster and in an automated fashion which should, in theory, allow those people to, instead of spending time at the precinct or the campaign headquarters crunching numbers, they can be out, you know, we can devote more of campaign staff to actually talking to people about the candidates and the issues. And I think that's what, you know, big data does. It certainly makes that process easier. You know, the reams of spreadsheets and voter contact forms, as we mentioned, you know, no longer exist because that information is being collected in real time at someone's door. Um, and, you know, the ability to use, you know, the voter file and to be able to use all of the supplemental insights that, that um, are appended to the voter file um, make the process of <clears throat> identifying and reaching out to individuals much easier, much more tactical, and much more efficient. Let me tell you what I hate. I hate focus groups, okay? Everybody hates focus groups. I mean, you got people who are going to show up for about 20 bucks and some free cookies to play Cisco and Ebert so, and spend four day hours of their life. So first of all, they can wreck an ad, though. They can have the best ad, and one person in that focus group is having a bad day saying, I hate that ad. It goes away. I hate pollsters that try to test ads over the phone because it's not the same as visually and emotionally seeing it. I hate candidates who tell me that them or their wife have come up with the best ad they've ever heard. My point being is, there is no formulaic way to deliver a campaign message. We can have great insights, 
based upon big data, but it does not replace the human side of this and the instinctual side and the experience side to say, here is a better way to do it. And sometimes people don't respond to things until they've actually seen it because they haven't thought that way. It's outside their perspective. And so I do get concerned that you're gonna have candidates every night asking about the simulation models from the night before and wanting to change their message on a daily basis based on that. And that's the disaster that is down the road if uh, that happens. Well, that's gonna end, I think, for this, for this particular panel. Uh, thank you all out there for the questions that you provided and thank our panelists for what I think was really an enlightening discussion of big data. Thank you.